Hello, my name is Dr. Beth Cutney, and in this video, I want to talk to you about a method for identifying, assessing, and mitigating risk. And in this video, we'll talk about failure mode and effect analysis. Failure mode and effect analysis, or FMEA, is a way to proactively and systematically go through your processes, your products, or your services to identify, analyze, prioritize, and document potential failure modes. What you want to do is identify ways in which your process, product, or services could fail. And then understand the effects that those failures could have on your customers and what those potential causes are. If we can understand the potential causes for these failures, we can identify ways to continuously improve our products, processes, and services to reduce the occurrence of those failures. And so the FMEA is an important methodology to recognizing and evaluating potential failure modes in our products, processes, and services. And the aim of implementing FMEA in your organization is to reduce or eliminate that potential for the failure. FMEA is a prevention-based tool. We're focusing more on being proactive rather than reactive. And it's a systematic methodology to identify any potential failure modes who are anticipating what those potential failure modes could be as we're developing or designing our products, processes, and services. And once we've identified those potential failure modes, we can then identify the potential causes for those failures. With this information, we can prioritize those failures based on the seriousness of that failure, how often it could occur, or how likely we are to actually catch it before it reaches our customer. And then we can use this information so that we as an organization can take action to reduce, mitigate, or eliminate those failures. There are two key types of failure modes and effects analysis. The first is the process FMEA, which focuses on processes. And it's typically used during Six Sigma or other continuous improvement efforts. The second is the design FMEA, which focuses on a product or a component parts when you're designing or redesigning a new product or process. And this is typically used in design for Six Sigma or other continuous improvement efforts. Now with FMEA, we're trying to take a proactive approach so that we're spending time up front because that further reduces costs for our products and services and processes. And it's much easier to make changes as we're developing these new products or processes. And it's also typically less expensive to implement it early in our design or process development. And if we use the FMEA tool properly, it becomes ingrained in our, into our continuous improvement efforts. If we can find a potential failure as we're designing the process, it's much easier and less expensive than we catch it in the prototype production or by the time the customer catches the defect. And at that point, it's a much higher magnitude of costs associated with the defect. Now, the failure modes and effects analysis follows a, a standard format, although it might change slightly based on company. In the top portion or the header of the form, we're capturing information on the type of product or process, when it was completed, and who was on the team that completed this FMEA. And this helps to make sure we have the proper documentation for document control. Within the FMEA form, we're capturing information such as the process function requirements, potential failure mode, potential effects of the failure, severity, classification, potential causes or mechanisms of failure, occurrence, current process controls, detection, the risk priority number, or RPN, any recommended actions, who's responsible on the target completion date, and then the results of those actions. We'll go through each of these in more detail next. When we look at the process function requirements, we're trying to understand what is that step that we are reviewing. And what is that step trying to or attempting to accomplish? When we think about a process FMEA, this is typically done machine by machine. And within each machine, we're looking at tool by tool to make sure that we're capturing every step of the process in the order that it occurs. 
The next step is to look at the potential failure mode. And this is the manner in which the process could potentially fail to meet the process or the design requirements. Some of the examples of potential failure modes include cracked, loose, bent, fatigue, the wrong part was installed, or the tool was worn. We next look at the potential effect of that failure. And in this step, we want to understand how the failure is going to affect the user or the customer. And this could be an internal or an external customer. So we need to be thinking about how the final customer would be affected by this potential failure and also the next step in the process. And when we do this, we want to make sure that we describe the effects of the failure in terms of what the customer would actually notice. So we're thinking about customer sensitivity here as well. And when we do this, we address the potential of the non-conforming product reaching the final customer. The next step is to look at the severity. So we want to understand how severe that effect is on the customer and what they're experiencing. This is performed on a scale using a rubric. Most commonly, the scale is from 1 to 10, where 1 is no impact through 10, which is serious. Now, some companies may modify this to a 1 to 5 scale, or they'll modify the rubric based on their customer needs. However, here is one of the most commonly used severity matrices with a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is the failure would not be noticeable to the customer and will not affect the customer's process or product. If we look at a rating of 5, the description is low, and the definition is that the failure creates enough of a performance loss to cause the customer to complain. As we start looking at ratings of very high, extremely high, or dangerously high, we're looking at where the unit could be inoperable or unfit for use, or could potentially injure the customer or the employee. The next step in the FMEA is to look at the potential causes or the mechanisms of failure. So we want to understand what could cause this failure to happen. Examples of this could be an inaccurate gauge, improper heat treating or torque, or lack of lubrication. It's important to note here that we want to avoid using vague phrases such as operator error. We want to know why there was an operator error. Was it lack of training? And it's important to note this because if one operator could make this error, another operator could make this error. So we're really not driving down to the true root cause of why the operator made the error. So we want to be as specific as possible here so that we can truly correct the potential causes or reduce those as much as possible. The next step in the FMEA is to look at the occurrence. And here we're trying to understand how often does this cause or failure mode actually occur. And if we're designing a new product or service, we may not necessarily have information on the occurrence, but we could go back and look at similar products or processes to look at their historical data and use that as information to input into our current FMEA. The scale for the occurrence is also on a scale of 1 to 10, and again, this might be modified to make sure it matches the specific needs of an organization. When we look at occurrence, if we start with a rating of 1, this is where the occurrence is very remote or very unlikely. And in other words, the failure rate would be one occurrence in greater than five years or less than two occurrences in one billion events. We can also look at that in terms of CPK, and this would be a CPK of greater than two. If we look at a rating of five, this is moderate where there's occasional failures, or in other words, this could be one occurrence every six months to one year, or five occurrences in 10,000 events. And this would be equivalent to a CPK of approximately 1.17. The next step in the FMEA is to look at current process controls. This is where we're using process monitoring to make sure that we have an acceptable process. Examples of current process controls include operator instructions, lot sampling, preventive maintenance, or visual inspection. Once we know what our current process controls are, we're going to rank these using our detection. And with the detection, we're looking at how well we can detect that cause or the failure mode. And again, here we're going to use a rubric on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is we should be able to catch all of them through 10, in which we will not be able to catch it. So when we look at our detection scale, again, this might be modified to meet your specific organization's needs. But in this example, if we look at a rating of 1, that means our detection is almost certain. 
In other words, the defect is obvious or there's a 100% automatic inspection with regular calibration and preventive maintenance of the inspection equipment. If we look at a rating of 5, this is moderate. And this means that some statistical process control is used in the process and the product, and final inspection is performed offline. When we look at ratings of 9 or 10, we have a very remote chance of actually catching the defect. And this means that we're either not inspecting it or the defect is not detectable. The next step in the process then is to look at our risk priority number. And with the risk priority number, we're able to prioritize where we should focus our efforts to correct the failure modes and their effects. The risk priority number is calculated by multiplying the severity ranking by the occurrence ranking by the detection ranking. And so if we consider our ranking scales of 1 to 10, the best case scenario is that we have a value of 1. Worst case scenario, we have a severity of 10, an occurrence of 10, and a detection of 10. And therefore, our risk priority number would be 1,000. Using our risk priority number, we can prioritize based on the highest RPN numbers where, as an organization or as a team, we're going to focus our efforts. Using these RPN values, the teams would then recommend actions to reduce the cause or improve the detection. Now, it's important to note as we go through and develop these action plans, we need to make sure that we're assigning responsibility and a due date, and we're documenting what actions we took. The FMEA is a living document, and by that I mean it's a document that you're continuously updating. And so we want to make sure that as we make changes, we're documenting those actions, and then we would also recalculate our RPN number. And then we can reprioritize where we focus our efforts based on what the highest RPN values are at that time. And by using the FMEA, we can drive our continuous improvement efforts by continuously focusing on our highest RPN values. I hope you found this video interesting and I wish you the best of luck on identifying, assessing, and mitigating the risk in your processes, products, and services.